Welcome to the San Mateo Arboretum Society's monthly Zoom seminar, Gardening for Butterflies, with Susan Karasoff of the Yerba Buena chapter of the California Native Plant Society. It will last approximately 60 to 90 minutes and be recorded. Following the presentation will be a question and answer session. Submit your questions during the presentation by clicking on the chat box icon. A few days after the presentation, you will be emailed a link to the recording and to an evaluation form to provide feedback. Before we start, a little information about what is happening at the Arboretum Society. Our nursery in San Mateo Central Park is open 11 to 2 on Saturdays and Sundays. Enter the North Gate. Payment is by credit or debit card and Apple Pay. No cash is accepted. We are monitoring the COVID situation and following all safety protocols. Check our website, sanmateoarboretum.org or call 650-579-0536, extension two for up-to-date information. While you're in Central Park, visit the Rose Garden, Butterfly, Hummingbird, and our new Sun and Shade Demonstration Gardens. All are maintained by the Arboretum Society volunteers. In addition, there's an artist exhibit open 10 to 3 Friday through Sunday in the Arboretum Society's Victorian Garden. Today's presenter, Susan Karasoff, gardens in San Francisco's clay soil and builds resilient local ecosystems with an only the easiest plant survive approach to gardening. That's my kind of gardening. Welcome, Susan. Hi, and thank you all for being here. Welcome Team Butterfly. I'm Susan Karasoff with the California Native Plant Society and we plant for butterflies. So today we're going to talk about why plant native plants, butterfly habitat needs, butterflies in plant communities, butterfly caterpillar plants in the gardens, container gardening for butterflies, year-round buffets for people and wildlife, and some native garden resources. Get used to those caterpillars and those chewed leaves those are the base of our ecosystem. So why plant native? Well, I don't know about you, but I don't dress like this anymore. And so I don't garden like this either. There aren't any butterflies in that landscape. And I want a landscape that is full of butterflies. Native plants are the base of the food web. A professor at University of Delaware, Doug Tallamy, did research and determined that each plant supports a different number of species of caterpillars and that the plants that support more species are more important to the ecosystem. California Native Plant Society, I'm in the San Francisco chapter, Yerba Buena. Our sister chapter, Santa Clara Valley, has had Doug Tallamy speak to them twice. And those lectures are on YouTube and they are amazing and helpful. Um, Doug Tallamy's research has just been vital to the way so many of us garden nowadays to add caterpillars to our landscape. We are adding those caterpillars because it turns out that baby birds can only eat caterpillars or very, very soft things, caterpillars and aphids, and caterpillars are just bigger and more protein filled than a small aphid would be. They're the equivalent of, of tofu or a hot dog for a baby. Human babies can't eat anything sharp. Well, baby birds can't eat anything sharp either. So if when we have caterpillars in a landscape, we have birds. If we don't have caterpillars, we don't have birds. And it turns out that plants from somewhere else introduced plants feed between zero and two insects here. They may have fed a lot of insects back where they were from, but they don't feed a lot of insects here in, in California. So we need to plant our local native plants to maximize the number of caterpillars. The insect declines that we're seeing are contributing to our bird declines. If we don't have insect, if we don't have native plants for our butterflies and our moths and our specialist bees, then we don't have, we don't have birds. Uh, bees and, and butterflies and moths are looking for native plants and birds are looking for caterpillars. So we used to think that we could just stick all of our biodiversity in parks and everything would be fine. 
but there have been two completely separate studies, one with German researchers in a variety of German nature preserves and one in a Puerto Rican nature, nature preserve that show that over time, just the sheer amount of insects, what's called biomass, has, has just dropped precipitously. And less than 4% of the land in the United States are national parks, state parks, and protected areas. So we can't depend on parks to save our ecosystems. In California, we have 1,500 species of bees and about 1,300 species of butterflies and moths. In the Bay Area, we've got about 200 species of bees and about 200 species of butterflies and moths. The Western monarch is one of our pollinators. It is one of those butterfly species and its population just crashed in 2020. We, we have to do more to plant for caterpillar plants. And I realize I am speaking to Team Butterfly. Most of you have milkweed in your garden. And what I'm going to ask you to do is add more milkweed and more caterpillar plants for the rest of our butterflies. Our ecosystem needs us to plant local native plants to feed our caterpillars to then feed the rest of our ecosystem. San Francisco Estuary Institute was funded to look into can urban areas support biodiversity and it turns out they can. And the top two things we need to do are plant native plants again to feed those caterpillars and to have green corridors uh, from, from our homes and our balconies and our institutional spaces, our schools and our businesses to help connect green space, the larger green spaces. So Golden Gate Park and the Presidio and Lake Merced are all pretty big green spaces, for instance, but we need to have green corridors to go back and forth so that butterflies can get all the, the food they need and so they can meet mate, mates. In San Francisco, we are 68% paved and less than 5% of our land um, still remains in any kind of natural format. So every plant we choose to plant is an opportunity to feed our ecosystem. So California is just complicated to plant in. In case you've wondered, why did I plant that and it died? It's, it's hard. Uh, your friends may live in an area with different soil and th than you have, and our plants are very much adapted to our varied soils and our weather. We've got sandy soil, we've got clay, we've got loam, we've got multiple kinds of stone. We've got serpentine stone and sandstone and chert. So if you've wondered why it's challenging to plant, well, that's why. We also have wind and fog and an enormous variation in our rainfall. Not only do we have those incredibly dry summers, but our precipitation can vary between seven inches and 50 inches and the last year we had eight inches of rain in, in San Francisco. The 50 inch years are when we have multiple atmospheric rivers. So it's really important to plant our local native plants because they are adapted to our soil and they're adapted to our, our weather. And once they've become established, which means you have to water them and take care of them for three to five years, they can then, especially when planted in their plant communities, survive year after year of drought and they're wildlife friendly and we get caterpillars. So plants evolved in plant communities on those soils and in that weather. And um, just a few of our plant communities include the grasslands, oak woodlands, riparian, which is a fancy word for creekside, coastal dune scrub and dunes. And our butterflies co-evolved with those plants. Butterfly caterpillars can usually only eat between one and a few plants. So it's important that we plant those local natives that the butterflies co-evolved with to be able to have butterflies in our garden. So let's talk about what butterflies need in terms of habitat. They need those caterpillar plants. So adult butterflies can eat nectar from all kinds of plants, but the caterpillars can eat very, very few plants between one and just a few. And so it's important that we plant caterpillar plants in our landscape. And so that's why this presentation is going to be all about the caterpillar plants. So not only do we need the caterpillar plants, the local natives, we also need leaves on the ground because caterpillars don't wanna be eaten by birds. And when they're, they're in their cocoon, they still don't wanna be eaten by birds. They're still delicious in a cocoon. And so they need to be able to crawl, crawl off and hide in a bunch of leaves. 
So please leave your leaves on the ground. And if you're thinking, ew, I don't want shade leaves and I don't want leaves on my ground. There's a wonderful aesthetic called wabi-sabi from the Japanese, and it is the perfection of imperfection. And so if you're, if you'd even consider letting leaves stay on your ground and having your leaves be, be chewed on, that means that you are contributing to the wabi-sabi aesthetic. And as Doug Talamy said from, from one of the people who learned from him, just join the 10 step program, back up 10 steps, you won't be able to see the, the, the leaves having been chewed on. We also do need nectar plants for adults. There are lots of those in the landscape. I'm somewhat less worried about those. And so many of our native plants not only provide uh, caterpillars food for the leaves, but they also provide nectar in their flowers. And then those green corridors are so important. So talking with your neighbors and your local green spaces and your parks to install your local native plants so that we've got caterpillar plants uh, as corridors. And just so you know, here in California, we have what are called hilltopping butterflies. So on the top of some of our hills, we end up having male butterflies waiting to meet mates. So tops of, of hills are really great places to go see butterflies. And now is a wonderful time to see them. August is a great time to go see butterflies hilltopping. So signs of a healthy ecosystem, you've got caterpillars and bee nests and bird nests and amphibians and predators. Anything less? Uh, we still need to work on that then. Butterfly habitat life cycle. So you may know this, but just for, for people who are a little unclear, the mama butterfly lays, lays her eggs on that caterpillar plant leaf. Sometimes it's just the one. This is the Dutchman's pipevine uh, swallowtail. Butterfly, absolutely gorgeous, big, um, beautiful, and incredibly strong flyer. She can only use one plant for her caterpillar babies, just the California Dutchman's pipe vine. And that pipe vine, as it turns out, only supports one butterfly, and that's her. And then we see the eggs in the, in the early caterpillar phases chewing on that leaf. It's adorable. They end up being um, big, healthy caterpillars in their last phase. And then they crawl off into the leaves to look for a safe place to hide. And then they pupate. So if you take a look at that cocoon, it looks like a, a dried up leaf. That's because that's why we want to have dried leaves in our landscape so that cocoons can hide. And they hatch and they start looking for nectar plants. A lot of nectar plants available to our butterflies, to our adult butterflies. So few plants that uh, will feed our caterpillars. Humans have trouble imagining only being able to eat one plant because we're omnivores. We're generalist feeders. We can eat all kinds of things. Caterpillars are specialist feeders and they just need a very specific set of plants. That's why we need to plant our local natives. So let's take a look at, at our local butterflies in their plant communities. And here are some icons to guide us through this, this, the rest of this presentation. Each plant will be labeled with the number of butterfly and moth caterpillar species fed by those plant's leaves. A little clot will show if that plant is a long blooming plant, and by long blooming I mean three months or more. I'm a very lazy gardener. I just want to put something in my garden and have it bloom for months. It's good for the butterflies, it's pretty for me, it works out well for everyone. There are a few plants that need regular water, so if you irrigate your, your garden regularly, those plants will need regular water. And then uh, just a couple plants that need a lot of water. Um, our willow needs a lot of water. It's uh, the keystone species for our riparian or creekside area. So we're gonna talk about the butterflies in the coastal dune and dune scrub, in the grasslands, in the oak woodlands, and that riparian and creekside area. San Francisco's got 35 butterflies. The peninsula's got an additional 17. So we're gonna see a lot of butterflies here. Any butterfly whose name is in red is endangered, threatened, or rare. So we especially need to plant for them. Not only do the monarchs need us to plant for them, all of these butterflies need us to plant their caterpillar plants in those red butterflies especially. And the lupines are absolutely gorgeous. Um, Mission Blue will only use the silverbush lupine, the lupinus alifrons, as its larval plant. A lot of the other butterflies that use lupines can use some of our, our many other lupines. The coastal green hair streak, 
doesn't fly very far. It needs buckwheat and deerweed. And you can see both uh, on the coastal green hair street, the Atman blue and the American lady, all of those are using buckwheat as a nectar plant. So it's a great plant to have in the garden if you've got sandy soil. So this is for all of you who are on sandy soil. These plants need sand. Atman blue, American lady uh, uses sagebrush as a, as a caterpillar plant. The echo azure uses cherry, our local cherry plants. Um, so the holly leaf cherry and the choke cherry are keystone species for the coastal dune scrub. Um, they can also grow into the oak woodlands, but they're mostly in coastal dune scrub. Ocean spray also, Echo Azure is a beautiful little blue butterfly. And because it can use a wider variety of plants, we can see more of it in our landscape. Pale tiger swallowtail can use cherry and California lilac, the gray hair streak, deerweed and buckwheat. Again and again, we hear deerweed and buckwheat, buckwheat and deerweed, lots and lots of buckwheat. If you are on sand, please plant our local buckwheat. That is Ariaganum latifolium and the painted lady, lady um, yarrow and lupine. Yarrow is a really bulletproof plant. If you are new to gardening, yarrow is a great plant, really hard to kill. More coastal dune scrub and dune plants. Um, orange sulfur, the silvery blue, the two banded checker. Um, Bataval blue, serrate orange tip, large marble, the western and the eastern tail blues. You're looking at lots and lots and lots of lupine and deerweed. Um, two banded checker skipper larvals on strawberry, which is really fun. Our strawberry plant is a wonderful shade friendly ground cover. There's two different versions, one for sand and one for clay. And those, uh, the ones for sand, those berries are part of their DNA is part of the supermarket strawberry. So it's a lot of fun to have. Grassland butterflies, there's this page and the next page. The most biodiversity that we have in California is in our grasslands. And because grasslands are sort of open, sunny, flattish spaces, we put a lot of houses and businesses there. So we don't have a lot of grassland left. And so if you would consider planting our grassland plants, that would be great. We've got three endangered grassland butterflies, the Bay Checker Spot, San Bruno Elfin, and the Monarch. Bay Checker Spot, the plantain it needs is the dot seed plantain. We'll be looking at that later. It's a short little annual. You could put it in a pot. It's wonderful. And um, Great to have in the garden. San Bruno Elfin uses stone crop, which is one of our um, succulents, another great plant in the landscape. Monarch uses well milkweed and it uses the California milkweeds, so not the East Coast milkweed. It uses it uses a different one. But we've got all kinds of not only um, those flowers like the plantain and the milkweed. We've got flowers like lomatium and the mallows, the checker mallows and the go goldenrod. So we've got flowers in our grasslands in addition to grasses. So fescue and wild rye and um, sedges and millet grass and bluegrass. <laughs> And uh, the poppies are, are a grassland plant. So these are really fun plants to have in the landscape. And we could just get this variety of butterflies if we have these plants and those butterflies are already nearby. So let's look at the oak woodlands. San Mateo Arboretum Society has got mournful dusky wings and western tiger swallowtail butterflies because as you enter San Mateo Arboretum, it's got that big, mature, beautiful coast live oak, Quercus agrifolia. Because San Mateo Arboretum Society has got that oak, we've got both of those gorgeous butterflies. And you can't see when you stand at the bottom of that oak that those leaves are chewed on. The oak supports over 200 species of butterflies and caterpillars. So, it's I'm not sure that has anything to do with it, but I'm just and trying to understand what this you is going on with. What you... Thank you. And so here are some of the other beautiful butterflies that also use oak leaves. The California sister, the California tortoiseshell. I don't even know how to pronounce that other dusky wing. <laughs> And other plants that are in the oak woodlands landscape include the currant and the California lilac and false indigo and the pipe vine, the Dutchman's pipe vine that we spoke about earlier. 
when we have false indigo and pipe vine in our landscape, then we get, we have the opportunity to have California dog face and pipe vine swallowtails. The California dog face is the official California butterfly. It's a really pretty little thing. It only, the caterpillars only use false indigo. So consider putting that in your landscape. Riparian is that creekside space. So we've got plants that need a little bit more water. Now take a look at the number of plants that use violet. The keystone species for riparian is willow. So we also have a number of butterflies that use the willow leaves. Violet is a wonderful plant. It's a ground cover. It's edible for people as well as butterflies. It likes a lot of shade and it's what's called summer deciduous. So if you put it in and you water it, gets water from the rain or it gets water from irrigation. As soon as you stop watering it, it will become what's called summer deciduous. The leaves will go away, but the, the roots will stay in underground. And as soon as the rain start again or irrigation starts again, then you get the violets. I love this plant. I grow this plant. I eat this plant. And I strongly recommend putting it in because look at the number of of butterflies who need it. Um, we've got three endangered butterflies that need it, plus additional butterflies like the Coriolis fritillary, but the variable checker spot needs it, the Calliope silver spot needs it, and the myrtle silver, silver spot needs violet in your landscape. It's a great plant and an easy plant and a shade friendly plant. Who wouldn't like that plant? Violet's another one of those interesting plants that will move between um, areas it's in the riparian areas, it's in the grasslands, in the shady spots, and it's um, in a little bit of the coastal dune scrub. Pipevine swallowtail is here too because the first few years of the California Dutchman's pipevine, it would like some extra water, please. Likes a lot of shade, it'll grow up either a willow or an oak, but it needs to be started in shade. So wonderful, wonderful. Um, butterflies that we have in the riparian areas. The western tiger swallowtail that you saw earlier with the oak woodlands that also flies at the San Mateo Arboretum Society not only uses the oak and the maple and the cherry but it also uses the willow so it flies between the oak woodlands and the willow in the riparian areas. So we've looked at these plants from the butterfly's point of view so now let's look at it from a gardener's point of view because all of us have certain needs for our garden. And I've got a tiny little garden and as much as I would like to have an oak in it, um, cause I'm in what would have been the Oak Woodlands area in San Francisco. I don't have room for a 70 foot by 70 foot tree, but I've got room for a lot of ground cover and shorter grasses. So we'll talk about ground covers and shorter grasses, uh, shorter flowers, grasses, compact shrubs, taller shrubs, vines, trees, and container plants. So these are just some of our evergreen ground covers. We talked earlier about stone crop. It's a wonderful evergreen ground cover in um, sand or rocky soil, beech knotweed, seaside daisies, very friendly to different kinds of soil. Uh, California lilac is a wonderful plant. It comes as a, a ground cover, a shrub or tree form. Fantastic at holding hillsides, wonderful for um, for butterflies and moths, it supports over 100 species. That strawberry we talked about earlier, edible and evergreen and shade friendly. California sagebrush is a wonderful plant, usually uh, a bush, but there are a couple of versions that are ground covers. And um, so I've got, <laughs> I've got this sagebrush ground cover and the strawberry ground cover and the violet ground cover because it's really fun and I like ground covers. Right there we are. And we've got some deciduous ground covers. So that violet we talked about, it's only going to have leaves that you can see during the rainy season or when you irrigate it. That, that absolutely um, gorgeous plant in the middle only grows on sand. It's really low growing. If I had sandy soil, I would grow it because it's beautiful and it supports a bunch of different butterflies. Rock crust, very low growing, supports a bunch of butterflies. It also wants sandy soil. And um, creeping snowberry, um, very low growing, tons of, it can take a ton of shade and tiny little, little pink flowers, just beautiful and supports a bunch of butterflies. And checker bloom, yet another one of the, um, <laughs> of the ground covers that I have. 
bright pink flowers and just beautiful in the landscape and, and great for butterflies. So I like flowers and when I was um, getting my garden designed by my garden designer, she insisted that I put in a, a grass and I was like, oh, there aren't any flowers. But it turns out we have a bunch of butterflies that, that uh, need us to put grasses in our landscape because they use those grasses as their caterpillar plants. And not only um, have I had umber skipper butterflies in my, in my garden every year because I put in a sedge, but it's really adorable. Adult butterflies will look at the top of the curve and hold on with their tiny little feet and bounce up and down like a trampoline. So put grasses in your landscape. They are so cute. And for climate change, they also have really, really long root systems. Um, so lots of underground carbon is stored, adorable playground for butterflies and wonderful for butterfly cat caterpillars. We have a lot of different grasses. A uh, few of them like the Western ryegrass can take some shade. Tons of grasses that the, the red fescue can, uh, can be mowed if you really want a, a native grass that's mowed. Also with those bunch grasses like the fescue and the hair grass, we have, butter, we have bees that like to nest in the ground and like to nest in, uh, in, at the bottom of hair grasses. So they're, these are our native bees. They're absolutely adorable. So we talk about the dot seed plantain. That is the only um, caterpillar plant for one of our endangered butterflies. So if you have room for it, it's um, maybe eight inches tall. It's an annual little white flower. You can grow it in a container or some so sunny part of your garden. It's beautiful, it's cute. The more of us who grow it, the, the greater that ability to, to expand the range for that butterfly. Lomatium, I don't see it much as a, gut, as, as a garden plant, but it's a wonderful plant. Um, those short, shallow little flowers are wonderful for butterflies and also other smaller insects to use as a, as a nectar plant. And it's a wonderful plant to be used for our, for our caterpillars. Yarrow is just bulletproof. That thing is easy to grow and hard to kill. And I love it. I mean, if you decide you don't like it, you can remove it. It is easy to remove, but um, let's just say I've, I've put it in public landscapes and seen it in public spaces and uh, it gets no summer water and no attention and it does just fine. And I love plants that are hard to kill. Sunflowers are wonderful. Caterpillar plants, as well as bee plants, the, the sunflower pollen supports over a hundred different bee caterpillar species. So it's an important plant to have in your landscape. You're gonna need full sun for that. Yampa, rarely known because the any swallowtail that we've got above on the lomatium also uses the yampa and that's the adorable little caterpillar down there. And California poppies, so well known, so easy to grow, full sun and supports our butterflies, butterfly caterpillars. More, uh, so, so in the shorter plants continuum, we've got deerweed. I don't know why they named it that. It's a really pretty plant. It's sort of a large, low growing bush. Yellow flower, flowers all summer supports so many of our rare butterflies and it's beautiful and easy to grow. Milk vetch, low growing, beautiful, easy to grow. Couple of different wallflowers. There's a yellow one and a white one supports, um, for all that it supports only two butterflies, <laughs> there are two of our local butterflies. Sea pink is wonderful. It's another one of the, the, the newer um, seen caterpillar plants for that coastal green hair streak. Sink foil is a great plant for, and, and a nice um, drought tolerant plant. The trifolium, which is our, our clover, it needs some water, but it, boy, it supports a lot of different butterflies. So if you are irrigating an area, consider adding that to your landscape. It supports a lot of different caterpillars on the leaves, supports a lot of insects with the nectar, and it's just really pretty in the garden. So more compact um, shrubs, that do well in some part shade because a lot of us have shadier part shady gardens, ragwort, nettle, pearly everlasting, cow parsnip, bee plant. All of these are wonderful drought tolerant plants that do really well. And bee plant is a nice long blooming plant. So really fun to have in the garden, 
easy to have in the garden and can handle quite a bit of shade. Compact shrubs that need some more sun. So buckwheat, we were talking about that earlier because it supports so many of our rare butterflies. Milkweed, it really wants full sun. Um, cudweed wants full sun. You're gonna to wanna to be careful with thistles. Always make sure to buy our native thistles. Um, there are some invasive thistles. Please don't add invasive thistles to our landscape. Um, and if you are a thistle warrior where you're out taking out thistles, just make sure you take out the invasive ones and not the native ones. It's, it can be a little hard to tell the difference. Um, I use a program called iNaturalist to help me identify plants and, um, and insects and animals. And so it, it helps me identify whether or not I'm about to take out a native thistle or not. And Horcolia also supports a bunch of butterflies, butterfly caterpillars. So now we're looking at something taller. All of the things that we've talked about before are pretty low growing. Lupine and the, the shrubby versions, they're just beautiful in the landscape. Albifrons absolutely positively wants um, sand. I have tried to grow it in clay and I have killed it. But Arboreus will take a, a lot, but we'll, we'll grow in, in clay, thank goodness. Um, sagebrush is wonderful. The Artemisia californica can take all kinds of different um, soils. The, the other couple are going to want more sandy soil. California lilac is amazing. Um, so a lot of you are local gardeners and you may already have some California lilac in your landscape. I have a California lilac problem. It is my favorite plant and I just adore it. It's available ground cover, shrub and tree. And so, so try to, to choose the one that's local to you that will support the most number of caterpillars with its leaves. They're so fun to have in the landscape and they're just so unbelievably beautiful. Vetch is beautiful in the landscape and supports a lot of, of caterpillars. Angelica, um, is a really interesting plant. It can grow pretty big. Drought tolerant, supports a lot of plants. And orange bush mon monkey flower. I will say I have had, um, I've, I have killed it. I have killed it uh, when we had drought a few years ago because I wouldn't water it. It's great for the landscape. It's great for caterpillars, but it, it's going to need a little water to help it through some of our more droughty years. We do have shrubs that are great in shade. Goldenrod, coffee berry, and red berry can take anything from full sun to full shade. Great plants, they get pretty big, and I'm just really grateful that they can take so much shade. Uh, I've got coffee berry in my landscape and it's just a great plant. Little tiny flowers, big, big hit for uh, the net as a nectar plant for the smaller insects, bees, and butterflies, plus it supports um, so over over 20 different kinds of, um, of caterpillars. And then huckleberry is just wonderful. It wants quite a bit of shade. It's not going to want full sun. It wants either part shade or full shade. It grows really slowly. It, to me, the leaves look a lot like Victorian box. It is evergreen. So beautiful, shiny. You can trim it to look really formal like a hedge, as you can actually with coffee berry and red berry. But those berries on huckleberry, those are delicious. It is a relative of the East Coast blueberries. And if East Coast blueberry were having Thanksgiving, it would be inviting huckleberry over. I happen to think huckleberry is more delicious than an East Coast blueberry. And that's why I have three of them. They are fantastic. So we do have some deciduous shrubs. I realize that some people don't necessarily like deciduous plants, but when you think of it from a plant's point of view, if you co-evolved with a bunch of butterfly caterpillars, you're going to have your leaves chewed on. So you can either drop those leaves and then grow new ones next year, or you can try to deal with the fact that you don't have all your leaves. These are some of our shrubs that decided that they were gonna drop their leaves and then just grow fresh. And so pink flower and currant is fantastic. It is gorgeous. Grow, it, it flowers during the winter, so December to February. Fantastic to have in the landscape. It's going to feed your hummingbirds that want to stay in your landscape in overwinter. It's going to feed your early arriving bumblebees that are coming out of their nests and are looking for some place to, to have lunch. And it's also going to feed your early flying butterflies, so really great to have in the landscape. False indigo, 
beautiful. I grow it and it hasn't bloomed for me yet. And I'm not really sure why, but it is supposed to be fragrant. And so I'm looking forward to the day that it does finally bloom. We do have roses in our landscape. We do have roses in California that are native. They are very, 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 very thorny. So you would want to use those someplace where when you put it in, you are not ever going to have to trim it. Um, you're going to want to just put it where it can get full size because it's going to be too thorny to trim. If you are looking for a barrier to keep people or or larger wildlife out, it is a great plant to have in the landscape and it supports over 70 caterpillars. So we looked at snowberry earlier in terms of the ground covers. Um, that is a particular species of snowberry that is a ground cover. There is another species of snowberry that is a shrub. I've got that one. It takes a lot of shade, which is wonderful. And it, and it is deciduous with those, it's so pretty with those tiny little pink flowers. And ocean spray. Ocean spray only wants to um, live on sand. It wants to be within about a mile of fog and wind because it loves, loves, loves fog and wind. And it's fragrant, so a lot of fun to, to have in the landscape. We've got a few vines that support our, our caterpillars. Dutchman's pipe vine we talked about earlier, that's what it looks like. It blooms in January, it is deciduous, but it's got those soft little leaves, so it's fun to have. We've got a couple of different peas and they are just so pretty. Um, so really pretty to have in the landscape. And then clematis is beautiful in the landscape. Soft, soft seed heads when it's done blooming. And so birds use the seed head material for nests. A lot of fun to have in the landscape. I've got one of the clematis and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, one of them, the Lassiana, is a lot more drought tolerant than the other. So let's talk trees. So we talked about oaks. In San Francisco, we only have one variety of oak. We've got the coast live oak, Quercus agrifolia, but down on the peninsula, you've got a bunch of other oak choices. You've got Lobata, Dorada, Chrysalepsis, and uh, Wislenzi. So beautiful oaks, lots of choices in terms of different sizes. I believe the one that you've got at San Mateo Arboretum is the coast live oak, and it is just a gorgeous tree. Supports close to 300 different species of caterpillar. It is keystone species in the oak woodlands that we've got a couple of different cherries. Um, it's, a, it's a great plant, really um, lots of, of white blossoms. You can use it as a hedge or you can trim it like a tree. And uh, the holly leaf cherry is evergreen and it's keystone species for the um, coastal dune scrub. Blue elderberry is a really fun plant. It's like a bird feeder. It's got over 20 species of caterpillars that use the leaves, which the birds like to eat. And then it's got those very, very shallow flowers where it attracts a lot of tiny insects and adult butterflies. Again, the birds like to eat. And then it's got those delicious berries, which are delicious for people and the birds like to eat them. So it's a great plant to have in the landscape. It does get to 30 feet though, so it can get pretty big. And then we've got a local maple here, the big leaf maple. It can get to 30 feet. It's got fall color, absolutely gorgeous. Keep in mind that if you decide to water it, it will be fine with that. I've seen it on Vancouver Island where it was 100 feet tall because it got a lot more water. So just be careful that you've got a space that's big enough for your big leaf maple and a space that's big enough for your oak. We do have some shorter trees. Our willows are a little bit shorter. And the toyon is a wonderful tree. You, you can have it be a bush um, or you can have it be a tree. Very friendly to wildlife. Uh, for all that it only supports for um, butterflies and moths, it does support some of our local butterflies. Red berries during the winter, which are very attractive to birds and help both local and migrating birds um, have enough energy to make it through the winter. And just a wonderful, a nectar plant for adult butterflies and bees and smaller insects. We, we do have a ton of native plants, the annuals and the bulbs that do really well in containers. I'm focusing here on caterpillar plants as I have throughout this presentation. So these are the caterpillar plants that would do well in a container. We've got some of our lupines that are annuals. So they've got shorter root systems that stone crop 
um, is a succulent, so it's got a short root system, dot seed plant seed, plantain, and the Chinese houses are all annuals, short root systems. You could put it in a window box or a pot, any kind of container. You are going to want to use um, a very well draining uh, soil for the stone crop and the lupine. Those, um, those would prefer well draining soil in your, in your pots and because you're using containers you get to choose what kind of soil you add. This is the only nectar plant I'm really going to advocate for. When I was finding pictures of butterflies for this presentation, I just kept running against all of our butterflies using the blue dicks as a nectar source. So even though I don't know of any, any caterpillars that it uses for its leaves, it's a little bulb smaller than a pearl onion. You can put it in a container, you can put it anywhere in your landscape, it does want full sun, and it just supports, it feeds such a wide variety of, of butterflies. I don't know what it tastes like for them, but it seems to be wonderful. So consider adding that to your landscape. So I, I like to eat. And so I like to think of gardening as putting in a buffet for wildlife and for people. So we're going to look at native plant buffets, um, which means they all support caterpillars. Plus we'll look at adult butterfly nectar buffets, hummingbird buffets, edible plants for people, and a bee buffet. Look at all these native plants that feed butterflies with nectar. So manzanita is a wonderful plant where it's important to plant early in the season to feed early arriving bees and butterflies and our overwintering hummingbirds. And it's important to plant late in the season, sort of July to October, because so few plants want to bloom then. Um, all the California native plants, if you think of it from a plant's point of view, really want to bloom March to June. They know how much water they've gotten, and now they know how many resources to spend on their root system versus growing new leaves or flowers. It's expensive for a plant to, to put out a flower and then grow a seed. So anything that we can plant that's early, such as manzanita, the seaside daisy, cudweed, we talked earlier about the currant, and um, and late bloomers such as, as goldenrod and, and coyote bush, gumweed and, and golden aster, uh, milkweed and year, the, the early season and the late season plants are really important to our landscape. So this is just the first page of the adult butterfly buffet native plants and this second page. Where the first page had more of the plants that supported more caterpillars. This is plants that support fewer caterpillars, but still support some in addition to supporting a nectar. And we do have some early blooming and later blooming plants. So great to have in your landscape. Really helps to have that, that year long flower buffet. Plus it's pretty to look at. Hummingbirds want to stay in our landscape. They wanna stay year round. They don't wanna to have to move. They don't wanna to have to look for, for more food. They don't wanna to have to have a larger area that they have to, um, have to guard from other birds and, and hummingbirds and other hummingbirds. So manzanita and barberry are wonderful early and current are um, those December to February blooming plants. You'll say, hey, I've got no natives in my garden and I still have hummingbirds. Yes, yes you do, because they're able to eat nectar from a variety of plants. But it turns out that for them to have babies, for them to have a nest, they need to get some protein that comes from tiny little insects and tiny little insects like the same plants that adult hummingbirds, that, that adult butterflies do. So please consider planting for hummingbirds in your landscape and you know you're successful when they have, um, when they have babies and a nest. There are lots of edible plants for people. The search term is ethnobotany. You need to know that, that word plus your local tribe to be able to find out what plants we had that were edible. So this is just a few of the edible native plants that we have and all of them support a number of caterpillars. So wonderful to have in the landscape. And bees, bees are our pollinators. They are part of our um, biological heritage and biological wealth. So we wanna support all of our pollinators, our bees and our butterflies and our hummingbirds. So. This is, uh, these are the particularly bee-friendly plants. 
So where can you find out some more information about what to plant? I'm gonna introduce you to iNaturalist, to Calscape, to some of the native plant lists and some of our community projects. I use iNaturalist. It is a citizen science project and it, lets, it helps me identify plants and animals and it also helps me identify where a butterfly happens to be because there's two ways you can get butterflies in your garden. You can plant the caterpillar plants for the butterflies that you want and hope they find your garden, or you can find out what butterflies already fly nearby and then plant their caterpillar plants, or you could do both. But the highest probability of you getting a butterfly in your garden is if you add the caterpillar plants for the butterflies that are already flying nearby you. And this is just a, a wonderful way of looking for that. So you can search for the, um, you can just search at the butterfly level and look at all of them. In this instance, we're looking at the Ackman blue butterfly and we're seeing where it's flying in San Mateo County. So this is a, a great tool to use. Um, it is a, a free mobile application and web application, which means you don't have to use your real name. Um, and it's, it's just a lot of fun to use. I've used this for all kinds of applications and it's, it's been um, wonderful at teaching me more about what plants and insects and animals I'm seeing. The California Native Plant Society has got our own plant selection tool. It's called Calscape. It's free. It's on the internet. I don't happen to think its web application is very good, so um, definitely pull your plant list together in front of a computer. <laughs> It also has a 10 mile radius and in San Francisco we're seven miles by seven miles and we have six kinds of soil. So my one concern with Calscape is that it will recommend um, plants for which I, the, soil, the soil type is inappropriate. Um, we have talked with them about that, they're working on it, they haven't fi fixed it yet. It, it's a big deal to, to fix that because California's geology is so varied. So just keep in mind that when you look at a pretty plant, just check the soil type. Lately, they added the butterfly information. So you can find out which butterflies each one of those plants feeds with its leaves. So that's exciting. And you can go back and forth between the butterflies and the plants and determine exactly what butterflies you want to plant for. Also has native plant nurseries. So for every plant you are looking for, you can, it, uh, there will be a list of the native plant nurseries that carry, at, carry that plant. So not only the plants, but the bulbs and the seeds. So really a, a useful one-stop shop for information about where to find the caterpillar plants you are interested in. And in San Francisco, because it is so challenging to plant with all of our different kinds of soil, we put together a bunch of, of plant lists. Um, that Gardening for Butterflies list is brand new it's not even on our website yet because the few people who can do that are both on vacation. But uh, it will be on our website soon. Our older one is there. So we have plant lists for butterfly caterpillars and hummingbirds and edible plants and bees and long blooming and shade and colorful and plant communities and sidewalks and container gardens. And for landscape design professionals, we have something called landscape design softscape. Softscape is the word landscape design professionals use to talk about plants. Um, as opposed to hardscape. So in case that word looks weird to you, it looked weird to me, that's what they call it. All of this is available for free on our website under biodiversity and biodiversity resources. There are a bunch of groups that are out there planting for butterflies. There's Nature in the City specifically working on creating that green corridor for the coastal green hair streak because that butterfly just isn't gonna fly very far without a snack. I know that feeling. I don't wanna go far without a snack either. There is San Bruno Mountain Watch where they've got the San Bruno um, elfin butterfly, which is endangered and the Mission Blue Butterfly is endangered. So they are planting for those, taking out invasive plants, doing a lot of restoration work there. There are a couple of, of chapters of the California Native Plant Society. We both do restoration, restoration work. The San Francisco chapter actually is all the way down to Highway 92. San Mateo Arboretum is just north of Highway 92. So that's part of uh, the Yerba Buena chapter. And we do a lot of restoration work. And then California Native Plant Society, Santa Clara Valley, the same people who have the two Doug Tallamy 
uh, lectures on their YouTube channel. They also do a lot of restoration work. And so if you live south or, or want to volunteer to do restoration south of 92, um, please look at the Santa Clara Valley website. Uh, they're, they're wonderful people and they've got their own nursery. We don't have a nursery. So they're also a great place to get your native plants. There are some national organizations that are out there um, communicating information about planting for butterflies. Um, Xerxes, there's the Monarch Watch, and Pollination Podcast at Oregon State tends to focus on bees, but they do have the occasional wonderful butterfly episode. So thank you so much to all the people in my naturalist whose photos I used and all the professionals whose photos and information and cartoons I used, and all the people who reviewed my presentations. We are the California Native Plant Society. We are Team Butterfly, and we want to work with you to create this world that is full of butterflies. So we're looking forward to working with you to make that happen. Thank you for planting butterfly caterpillar plants. That's time for questions. So let's look at the chat. Okay, um, which butterflies and plants are also in San Jose? Um, so I, I did look at San Mateo County. Um, there's a high probability. So, so San Mateo County and San Francisco, I, butterflies don't care about our political boundaries. They laugh at our political boundaries. <laughs> and, um, and so a lot of the San Francisco butterflies are in San Mateo. A lot of the San Mateo butterflies will be in San Jose. One of the things you can do is go to the Calscape website and, um, and put in your address. And they will tell you what butterflies are local to you and how to plant for them. Let's see. Um, oh, good. Thank you, Edward, for talking about how to use Calscape. Um, let's see. Oh, good. Catherine Roberts knows how to pronounce that. I'm still not going to try. Pro Propertious um, dusky wing. Let's see. Oh, Mary Beth, you're advocating for berms. Oh, yes. So Edward, yeah, elevated beds work if you don't have sandy soil. Um, yeah, I am, have I mentioned how lazy I am? I may not have mentioned it in the last few minutes. Elevated beds are fun. Um, they also prevent less, uh, less bending, but somehow all of my ended up, uh, all of my elevated beds ended up um, getting clay soil in them. So I, I did try them with some sand plants and it, it still didn't work for me. But again, I'm a pretty lazy gardener. Uh, there's also something called hugel culture, which I did not know about back when I put my elevated beds in. And it's basically where you take some chunks of wood. So definitely try to take one of the local ones. Don't use acacia. Um, a, a chunk of oak or something from when someone or, or one of your city arborists is cutting down some things, take some chunks of wood and put those at the bottom of your elevated bed and then put uh, soil on top of it and it will do a slow release of, of nutrients and it's wonderful. Oh, Susan Ford is asking about how these indoor, indoor butterfly shows affect survival of species. Yeah. I haven't looked into that. Um, I'm, it, it worries me. I don't know if when, if one of those butterflies got out, if it would become an invasive species. The cabbage white butterfly, which is the little white butterfly that seems to be in everyone's garden because it seems to be able to use so many plants as a caterpillar plant, is from Europe. It, it came here with broccoli and cauliflower and in cabbage. It is invasive. It's con considered invasive in British Columbia. To my knowledge, it's not considered invasive in California yet. Um, let's see. What other kinds of questions do we have? Okay. Other questions?
and I apologize, I did not use my cursor enough to, uh, oh, Janice asked if it was difficult to locate um, the blue dicks bulbs. I found them at Oakland Nursery, oh, I'm sorry, Oak, Oaktown Nursery in, um, in Oakland, which is across the street from Vic's Chat, which is a South Indian restaurant. And so it's just this incredible magnetic force for me between the delicious Indian food and the wonderful um, native plants. It's, it's, that's difficult to, to be. Um, that's where I personally bought my, my blue dicks bulbs. I would check on Calscape. Uh, they've, they've got all of that information. I didn't see it at um, East Bay Wilds, but I'm not sure I looked. And, and yes, Teresa, go to Calscape to find the butterflies in your neighborhood. Uh, Calscape and iNaturalist. So Calscape will tell you what should be there. iNaturalist will tell you what is there. Um, and again, uh, there's, I would call it a balance, but I'm not a terribly balanced person. I just planted for every butterfly you could shove into my garden. Um, and, and some of them have shown up. I've got a willow, so I've got the Western Tiger Swallowtail. Um, which there's a, a, a big, um, or there was a big coast live, live oak two blocks away. It was damaged during a storm and they've now put in a, a few baby coast live oaks. But I've, I've gotten a Western tiger swallowtail every year from the time that willow was a one gallon. And I get umber skippers every year because I've got that sedge in my garden. So there's that I'm gonna use the word balance again between use our naturalist to find out what butterflies are near you, plant for them, and then plant for the butterflies you also want. Because if you and your neighbors and local green spaces and parks start to plant for those local butterfly caterpillars, then there's a good chance that we will eventually get them from wherever they've been left, which is maybe the Windy Hill Preserve um, and a few other preserves they need to be able to have a snack everywhere they fly, um, both as adults and to, and to have some place to, to lay their caterpillar, to, to lay their eggs. So that's what this is for. Um, let's see. And what other questions do we have? Oh, Naomi, how does a butterfly find the green corridor, especially if they're far apart? Such a good question. Um, that has me worried. So <laughs> um, let me show you what, if you take a look at that green hair street corridor, think of it from a butterfly's point of view. They don't wanna fly very far. So for every place where there is currently butterfly plants, the caterpillar plants and nectar plants, to be able to talk the people right in, in the next block into planting those plants as well is really important. And um, so that requires a lot of, of outreach. And so if any of you know some extroverted people who are happy to, to chat with, with neighbors and people they don't know, everything's going to grow from where those butterflies currently are because they really do not want to fly very far and they don't have the internet and Yelp. They can't find out where the snacks are. They're depending on finding snacks nearby. So the best we can do is create green corridors between the larger green spaces that currently have butterflies. Ideally, we would all have caterpillar plants in our landscape. So as you have as you plant caterpillar plants, take pictures of your, your caterpillars on your plants and share those with your friends and families and neighbors and, and just show them how cute caterpillars can be. They're a little bit like teenagers. Um, they eat, they sleep. They do not want me standing next to them cooing over how cute they are, but they are, they're just so cute. Um, Let's see, Teresa, how do, how, do, how do you find the plants that they want to eat? So, so go to Calscape. Um, you can either use this presentation, uh, which will be available. I'm going to make all of the slides available 
to um, to San Mateo Arboretum. Uh, it will take a little bit because it's a very large file, but in a couple of days uh, that should be available. Also, there were a couple of handouts associated or flyers associated with this presentation. There's one that's text per butterfly, which, uh, which plants it uses. And then there's a graphical um, one page, both sides that has 24 of all these butterflies with about over 40 between the peninsula and in San Francisco. But I would start with, with Calscape actually. Check Calscape, see where you are, see what butterflies you have, and then use either one of those, either the word or the, the graphical um, flyer to help you decide what you want to plant. Um, let's see. And yes, you can go to Calscape to find the butterflies for your neighborhood. I, I would do Calscape and iNaturalist. Calscape, all the butterflies that should be there. iNaturalist, all the butterflies that are there that people have taken pictures of. Oh, Vivian, you sometimes have blue dicks at the uh, California Native Plant Society, Santa Clara Valley Nursery. Thank you for letting me know. Oh, Linda Vis Vista Natives. Oh, I haven't gone there. I have to try that. So Teresa, um, milkweed in your garden for several years and it's multiplied and you have no caterpillars. Um, so Teresa, I am so sorry um, that you are not ca getting caterpillars. I have never gotten caterpillars and I have got, I've had the native milkweed in my, um, in my garden for 15 or 16 years now. So, um, this is our problem with the, with the monarch butterflies. Keep putting milkweed in your garden and keep using the Western milkweed. So the narrow leaf uh, milkweed and Vivian, I think it's the showy milkweed, the speciosa. Um, if nothing else, those flowers are late blooming, they're blooming right now and they will feed adult butterflies and bees and small insects. I'm very concerned about the Western monarch population crash. All we can do is, con is continue to put milkweed in our gardens, continue to ask our parks and local green spaces to plant milkweed as well. When we do not have milkweed, we do not have um, monarchs. So the reason we don't have as many butterflies as we used to have is we took out their caterpillar plants and we fragmented our landscape and a lot of pesticide is used. And we believe that that's why we've had all of our um, insect populations crash. It's not a pretty story and it's up to each one of us to put caterpillars back in our landscape, advocate with our parks to do the same and, uh, and with our friends and our neighbors. Okay. Oh, thank you, Vivian. Yeah, the narrow leaf milkweed Asclepius fascicularis. Oof. Yeah, it's just difficult to say. All right. Family, I don't know a milkweed nickname, Family Jewels. Um, yeah, you're going to get caterpillars with Dylan Parsley. It's probably the Anis Swallowtail. We've got about a half a dozen different butterflies that have each been able to find one introduced plant that it can use. And the Annie Swallowtail can use um, fennel and dill. And um, the West Coast Lady, Red Admiral, um, each one of them have been able to find one other plant they can use. Western Tiger Swallowtail can use the London Plane Tree Hybrid. Please don't plant those. Each one of those can only support one caterpillar and fennel is invasive. So yeah, don't, don't plant that in your landscape. We can do better than that. Um, the Western, the Annie Swallowtail uses Lomatium, it uses yarrow, yarrow. Uh, it uses native plants, ideally, at Yampa, that would support other caterpillars as well. So let's, let's maximize the caterpillar value we can get out of each one of those plants. Oh, Naomi, you overwintered an Annie Swallowtail chrysalis. I'm so glad. They're, every one of these caterpillars is adorable and the, um, and the, I just, I love the caterpillars over the eggs and the caterpillars and the butterflies. It's just wonderful to see all of them. Oh, I'm so glad you did that. Thank you. Um, 
Oh, is Family Jewels the tropical mil milkweed? Yeah. Ew. Vivian, thank you for the information. Um, tropical milkweed harbors diseases if it doesn't go dormant. Oh, Naomi, where's the video? We all want to see it. Oh, it sounds adorable. By the way, um, iNaturalist will take your pictures and your videos. You can upload that. Um, if you join it now, you can upload pictures you have taken before. I, it's been such a great tool for me to um, learn about all of the wildlife around me. And you can upload video and you can upload pictures. As, as Sclepia speciosa, um, that one should be good. Um, Teresa is asking that just to me, but Vivian is also on. And um, I believe California Native Plant Society, Santa Clara Valley carries both the narrow leaf milkweed, the Sclepia fisciculatus and the speciosa. Um, yeah, Vivian, speciosa is fine. Yeah, you do have both. I was pretty sure I had that. Yeah, because Vivian and I checked your website before I added. Um, because in San Francisco, we're not supposed to plant it, but I just haven't seen it. So where's my milkweed? Yeah. So both the Fisicularis and the Speciosa are the two species to have, and they're wonderful. It's not just monarchs that use them for caterpillar plants and they're long blooming and they're late blooming. So they're a great plant to have in the landscape. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Vivian, is there anything else that you think people need to know? Mary Beth, anything else that I missed? Um, Vivian is the president of the California Native Plant Society, Santa Clara Valley chapter, and Vivian is wonderful. Okay. Any other questions? Right. Suzanne, it's all yours. Wow. Thank you, Susan, for that excellent presentation. You supplied us with a wealth of interesting plants and information to welcome butterflies and caterpillars to our to our gardens. I'm no, I'm definitely going to go to those websites and uh, see what see what I have locally and plant appropriately. So in a few days, all registrants will be emailed a link to a recording of the presentation and an evaluation form. Any unanswered questions can be addressed at that time. We appreciate your feedback on what worked and where we can improve. Please join us for future seminars and workshops. Uh, the next Zoom program will be a children's workshop, Let's Grow Herbs and Radishes, on Sunday, September 12th from 1 to 2 p.m. The fee for Arboretum Society members is $10 and $15 for non-members. Registration is required. Go to our website, sanmateoarboretum.org for more details and to register. While you're at our, our website, join the Arboretum Society and receive a discount on workshops at a variety of nurseries and bis businesses on the peninsula and 10% on all purchases at the Arboretum's nursery. We also have a variety of opportunities volunteer opportunities from working in the nursery to maintenance, office administrative, community outreach, and an opening on the education committee, organizing these monthly seminars and workshops. You can let us know if you are interested by signing up on our website, sanmateoarboretum.org, emailing us at info at sanmateoarboretum.org, or calling 650-579-0536. Thank you again to Susan and to Kevin, our Zoom technical specialist, and to all of you for joining us today. The program is now finished. <laughs>